We've all been hurt. We all have scars. And through a relationship with Jesus Christ, we can all overcome and we can all be healed. Welcome to Healing Scars with Pastor Burton. Hey everybody, welcome back to the sanctuary. So another year's gone by and I have once again made my annual trek out to OKC um, to go and hang out with some of my favorite people. Um, and, and it's always good to go back out there. Um, you know, it's good to have the fellowship. It's good to have the camaraderie and the love. And, and something that has always stuck out is the testimony. Every single year, I get to go out. I get to hang out with all these amazing people. And I get to hear these amazing testimonies. And, you know, it, it's it's always gotten me thinking, you know, that... A lot of times, people are out there, they're giving testimony, and they don't even realize it. God's light is shining through us and lighting not only our paths, but the darkness that others around us have been dealing with. The fact that we share so much is part of what makes coming together so electric. Uh, you know, a, a, a little bit of common ground that you might have with someone is what turns the, the field drastically. You go from going in and just having this little, mm, you know, meeting a couple people to suddenly having this leveled huge field very quickly. All right. And that's, that's going to be what I'm talking about today. So we're going to get some legalistic jargon out of the way real fast. So go ahead, open your Bibles up. Second Thessalonians chapter one, Verse 10, and the Bible says, On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who believed, this includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. So this is identifying testimony as witness. It is a form of evidence. A very legalistic definition, even by today's standards, you know, hello, uh, Law and Order, doom, doom. you know, I wish I kind of had a little soundtrack button for that this moment. So, it, it, you know, it's, it, it is, it's extremely legalistic. Uh, now, but we're going to go a little bit further here. Flip over to uh, Psalm uh, 119, and we're going to look at verse 88. So Psalm 119, verse 88, the Bible says, in your unfailing love, preserve my life, that I may obey the statutes of your mouth. Even better, look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible says, Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instruction among my disciples. And emphasizes this in Isaiah eight twenty. In which the Bible says, consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. What is all this? Well, simply put, it's the scriptures as the revelation of God's will. You know, people say, oh, I don't know what God wants from me. And they're right. They don't. And you know why? It's because they don't read the scripture. They don't read God's word. They have a Bible and it sits there and it collects dust. You know, um, you go into a parking lot outside of a church on any given Sunday, you just kind of walk through, there's a good chance you'll, you'll probably even see a Bible that's been sitting in that back window, and you know, just collecting dust and it's faded and crudded and just kind of worn out and falling apart because, you know, the sun's done its damage. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, the Bible is the it, the number the the number one book sold around the world is the Bible. So many are sold, and it, so regularly they don't even put it on the list because I mean it's just the champ. The champ is not dethroned ever. All right, um, that, that's how popular it is. Yet people don't ever even look at it. You know, they might open it up once or twice once they get it, but then that's it. You know, so, it, it, you know, what is scripture? It's the very word of God. This is God's way of talking to us. 
you know, the, first and foremost, you know, binding up and sealing God's instruction there in verse 16. It's talking about writing down his word and passing it along to the next generation. You know, we, we have our Bible today because past generations ensured that his word was preserved and passed it to us, you know, and now we've inherited that, that same mission, you know, um, it, it's on us to become those scribes, um, you know, um, over the years, that's why they talk about like the scrolls and everything, because, you know, how, whatever form was used at that time and, you know, and it, it's moved forward, you know, and of course, as time goes and the way, um, you know, people talked at the different dialects, different languages, you know, the, the, as the vernacular changes, of course, you know, the wording changes a little so that it can still speak to the people, still get the same message across. You know, it's like even here in the, in the, the U.S., people talk about the Bibles and they're like, oh, it's not the original. Well, hey, guess what? Um, you can go out there and you get yourself a Bible written in Greek or Hebrew and neither one of those is going to be the same as it was back then because of the same reasons, the way people speak and the way that the language has changed over the years. You, If you were able to actually go out and find something in the original, good luck with that. Um, unless you're a scholar that works in that field and, and has access to those libraries physically, you're, the, the odds of you actually seeing that kind of stuff is next to nil. But even then, you'd go through and you would read it. You know, it, it's... People struggle just to decipher the King James Version. It's like, this isn't, I don't read Shakespeare. What is this? Nobody talks in these and thous anymore. And it's the same kind of thing. All right. Uh, a little bit of a rabbit trail there. Um, like I said, coming back, we've inherited the same mission, you know, to, as, you know, as people and generations have gone past to become the scribes to pass on the mission, um, you know, to pass on, pass on the word, uh, you know, years past, you know, call them scribes and write it down. Um, even you think of, um, even older times, you know, how, how were things uh, passed along in the oral traditions, you know, song and story and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, and I, and I guarantee, you know, I know that there's someone out there who's like, what do you mean? I'm on a, I have a mission here. You know, you weren't expecting to be told it, but Hey, guess what? Yeah, here we are. And we do. And it's amazing because we've all been doing it all along. Just being here um, and listening, you know, it's because you believe in that mission of not leaving a fellow warrior behind. Now, you know, from a, a very military aspect and for veterans, you know, and this pertains to first responders and all as well, you know, that, that was, that's my heart. That's what I, I did for a long, long time. You know, well, we don't want to leave anyone behind on the battlefield and the various theaters of war going on in their hearts and their minds. We often forget about the spiritual war that's going on in each and every single one of us and everyone that's around us. We get so focused on helping each other and trying to save each other, um, you know, physically, mentally, um, and so on, that, you know, we forget about the most important trauma that's out there that needs to be treated, the spiritual trauma. You know, our, our focus is so caught up on, on just what we're seeing in front of us. Like I said, that physical, those emotional, the, the mental aspects, you know, it's very much, a, you know, if you would, a, a, a holistic needs type of approach, you know, because it doesn't do us any, any good. I mean, you know, are we going to keep someone breathing? Yes. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. Don't twist it or contort it. I mean, that, that is good. But, I mean, what, what good is it if we are to pick up, you know, our brother or our sister just to leave them in condemnation? We need to ensure that they know the gospel. Not that they've heard, you know, a little bit of something or watched a little something on TV, but that they truly know the gospel. And that comes from our testimony. Okay, our testimony. Um, Isaiah chapter 43, if you open up to that. So Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. The Bible says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. And in Isaiah 44, just a little bit later, if you were to flip over to that. So Isaiah chapter 44, verse 8, the Bible continues on to say, Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? 
No. There is no other rock. I know not one. See, our our testimony is a huge part of how we answer the call uh, of the Great Commission. You know, how, how we go out about it. Our testimony is to share our personal accounts of what He has done for us in our lives. You know, well, well, a lot of people out there in the world, you know, well, you know, people in general, you don't see God directly. You know, it's not like we don't get to come like face to face and have a, conver- a, ca- a casual conversation like we would with any other Joe Schmo. However, while the people of the world don't see him and they don't know him, they do see his love and they do see his light. And it's because it's reflected in. In us as Christians, as followers of Christ, it's reflected through our words and our actions, our examples. So, you know, here at this point, someone's out there thinking, oh boy, you still have to go out into the world and start throwing scripture at people. Well, yes and no. You know, to those who haven't been saved, to those who don't know Jesus, you and I are all that they're probably ever going to know of him. You know, again, this comes back to our words and our actions are what they see. So do you reflect his light, his hope, his love? Or are you a jerk? What do they see? You don't have to use scripture to show the Lord in your life. His work is in your life. His work in your life is your testimony all right so you know I, I have a you know every year when I go out this year was the first exception we missed him you know but uh, you know we one of our buddies uh, you know our brothers uh, Shane he comes out and he, he very eloquent pu- uh, puts it you know uh, if you've ever had a relationship you can sell um, and, it, and it's the same the same thing you know as, you know he's talking about sales but um, in this respect you know it, it's the same thing you know, you think about it. Who who all do we know? Who all is out there? Who all is listening? Who you know? Who all is present? We got veterans, first responders, teachers, cooks, construction workers. Um, you know, you name it. Um, customer service. Uh, you know, uh, representatives, uh, technical support representatives um, are out there. Um, truckers, bus drivers. Um, you know. Everything you know, janitors, everything, all the, everything across the board. Uh, but here's the point. In the words of the electric one, it doesn't matter who you are. Okay, you can be a janitor, or you can even be a down and out, living on the street, kind of struggling, not knowing how you're going to get by one day to the next. Yet you'll still have the story of God intervening in your life. Who sent you into the world? God. Who set uh, set you up that once in a lifetime uh, trip? God. Who cre- who helped you? Uh, who who created those memories with friends and family? God. Who convinced you to make that career change? God. Who heck? Who who um, kind of nudged you into uh, putting in for that position that you were really hesitating on? God. You know who who helped you to become a parent when you never thought you would? God. Who pulled you out of that bottle and helped you to sober up? God. Who pulled you out of that 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 position that was out there um, where you were you were about to be killed? God. Who sent someone to you when you were hurt and might have died? God. Who kept you from hurting someone else? God. The reason that kept you from pulling the trigger when you were so convinced you were done with life? God did that. And there are so many things that happen in our lives. Everywhere, each and every single one of us, there are so many blessings that we can share. That's God. What God speaks into our lives is what we can share with the world so they can see him in us. I mean, you can go out there, yeah, you could throw scripture at people, absolutely. But to those who don't understand it, you're speaking in a foreign language. Look at the disciples. What did they do? Did they go to some fancy college? No. Now, they did spend, you know, three years learning directly from Jesus. So they learned a lot, yes. 
However, their greatest testimony was from their own experiences, their own relationship with Jesus and what God had done for them and their own walks. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to go ahead and open up to that. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, the Bible says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. It's about Jesus. Now, when we give our testimony, we need to remember not to put him in the back seat. See, it's, it's not about us. It's not about our accomplishments or our abilities. What it is, it is about what Jesus has done. People need to be introduced to him. Not us. They already see us. We need to be pointing the way, just like John the Baptist. We need to be pointing the way to Jesus. When we go out there, we're talking, we're sharing things. You know, as my wife likes to say, it's not about you, Burton. Well, hey, it's not about me. It's not about you either. It's about Jesus. When people hear you preaching, I'm sorry, when, pe when you hear people preaching about their own ideas instead of Christ, that's when you need to watch out. You need to look out for those false teachers, all right? But when they're preaching about the things that God has done for them personally, when they're sharing the word with those who are ready to hear it, that is powerful. That's, you see, that's where it comes back to being a servant leader. See, serving people, it's not cheap. It's not. Serving people will require time. Serving people will require effort. Serving people will require sacrifice. And people, without a doubt, will disappoint you. Matter of fact, there will be some that won't even come close to living up to what you would expect from them. But let me remind you, the Bible tells us, we all fall short of the glory of God. Each and every single one of us. Because it's through His mercy and His grace that we're saved. See, we, you know, think about it. We all know those quote-unquote adults who still act like children. You know, you go to work and, you know, or even if you don't work with them, you go someplace where you see them frequently. And you're like, oh gosh, this moron again. It, it's a fact of life. So what is it about testimony then? It's the power that our testimonies hold. See, your testimony is a declaration of the truth of God. John chapter 8, verse 32. The Bible says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Just a few verses later, in verse 36, the Bible continues on to say, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's power. That's freedom. Jesus is the truth that sets us free. No matter where we are in our life or where we are in our path, that's freedom. Freedom from continued slavery to sin. Freedom from self-deception. Freedom from Satan. When we look at serving God, His truth frees us to be who He intended for us to be. We get to finally become the people. Now, it's not instant, of course. It takes time. But at that point, once we, we finally get to taste that freedom, we finally start changing into who we are supposed to be. Now, let's go back a little bit here to John chapter 4. And, you know, when you look at John chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 38, the, the Bible tells us about the Samaritan woman um, who met Jesus at Jacob's well. All right. Um, keep in mind, she had never met Jesus before. Here's a woman. She had committed so much sin. So much 
that she went out of her way to stay clear of the people of her own town. You know, pe- people knew her. They knew they knew exactly what was up. You know, it's, it's kind of like these days. You talk about, oh, yeah, they've been around the block a time or two. This was that woman. She had been married several times. She was living with another man who wasn't even her husband. And again, you know, like I said, she had never met Jesus. Yet here he is coming up to her, talking to her, and telling her about all the things that she had done. Her, her past transgressions, if you would. All right, He's letting her know, hey, I know who you are. I still don't have a problem talking to you. He treated her like a human being. He treated her with compassion. He showed his love. Now, now she believed. It was life changing. This is what's, and that's what's meant by life changing when people talk about life changing things in the Bible. So she came out of hiding. Happily, she came out of hiding and she ran and she started telling everyone about Jesus. Her testimony after this brief encounter with the Lord. And it was, it was a very brief encounter. So what happened? In verses 39 through 41, the Bible says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of a woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because because of his words, many more became believers. So what so what, what happened here? Did she go into town and start throwing scripture around and preaching at people? You know, was that, was that her thing? Was she out there just, you know, stand, you know, be basically becoming a, a street corner preacher and just, you know, throwing it all at people? No, absolutely not. All she did was she went in and she started telling people what Jesus did for her, what Jesus had told her. And, because of her belief in him, she was free. Because of what the people saw in her, they believed. Jesus changes our lives. When we truly accept him, we change. And while it might not always seem like it, because I mean, it's going to change a lot of things in your life. Things are, some things are actually going to get hard. But everything that changes because of Jesus in our lives is for the better. So John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verses uh, 29 through 51. The, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist gave his testimony of Jesus to two of his disciples. Remember I talked about this not that long ago. Um, what? Two, three, or maybe even a month ago. I guess maybe it has been a little while. But what, but what happened here? John the Baptist, he, he gave his testimony. He told a couple of his own disciples, his own students, who Jesus was. He was pointing the way to Jesus. And the same thing happened. That testimony of one person brought more students to Jesus. All right. So if you recall just a little bit ago, um, at the t- closer to the beginning of this, um, you know, I, I did say, you know, your testimony comes from what you say and what you do. And I like to share uh, one of my favorite examples of this. And, and some of you may have heard this story before. Um, it, it's it, it's history. You know, it's not even a story. It's history. This is this is something that actually happened. Um, you know, a long, long time ago. Um, you know, those of you who study history fervently, fervently uh, military history, um, especially, um, and not not from the U.S. This actually this, uh, didn't happen here in the U.S. Um, back to the U.S. didn't even exist yet. <laughs> so, um, in what we know today as Turkey, the Roman Emperor uh, Valerius, uh, um, I'm I'm going to butcher his name here a little bit, Valerius. Uh, Licinius, uh, Licinius went to great lengths to persecute Christians. 
and to get them to renounce their faith. Now, about 320 AD, there were 40 Roman soldiers uh, who had professed themselves as Christians, and they refused to sacrifice to the pagan gods, and they were being ordered to do this. So what happened was they were stripped of their military titles, jailed, and essentially tried uh, for, tre for treason, just for professing their faith, okay? Um, this all took place in the winter, and um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the ge geography, and I know most people aren't, because so geography is kind of rough, um, in that area in particular, winters get really, really harsh, like insanely harsh. Um, and this, their sentence, the sentence of these 40 tr um, soldiers, was that they were going to be taken out to a frozen lake, stripped naked, and then sent out onto the lake. The soldiers, and the soldier, uh, more soldiers were going to, you know, those who were loyal, um, they were going to be placed all around the lake. Basically, they are going to put sentries all the way around the lake to make sure that none of these men tried to escape. And what they did was they took, um, they basically set up a, a, a tent with a warm bath, um, so kind of a, a makeshift bathhouse, uh, but they set up a warm bath just a little ways away from them um, on the shore. All right, so all any of them needed to do to be forgiven was to renounce their faith, and then they'd be taken straight to the bath to warm up. All right, so that, that's pretty harsh. I mean, basically, they're being marched out, um, stripped naked, and being told, hey, you're going to go out there, and you're going to freeze to death tonight unless you renounce your faith. It, plain and simple, that's what it came down to. So they went on to show just how great their faith was. When they were taken out, they didn't wait for the guards or the, you know, the other soldiers to come and strip them. They took off their own clothes and then ran out onto this lake like a bunch of madmen. Like they just ran out on the lake like, hey, check this out. We're good. God's on our side. Woohoo! And they, they're, they're out there. They're very motivated, you know, and they encouraged each other. Um, and, they, and, and this stood well into the night, and that temperature, it dropped to absolutely unbearable levels. Now, when this happened, one, only one, a single soldier came off that lake, came out of that ice, and went to renounce his faith. So they took him to the bathhouse, and basically he, he died of shock as soon as he got in the tub. Plain and simple. And knowing now what we know about hypothermia and all that kind of stuff, and uh, we understand why. Um, now... Upon seeing the conviction of the remaining 39, one of the sentries who was watching, who was not a Christian, he's watching what's going on, and he has a, a vision, uh, basically like you know, of, you know, this vision of crowns on all their heads, and that they're warm. Um, at this point, just seeing their action, seeing their actions, the testimony of what they were doing, that converted him. He went and he professed his faith. Stripped down out of his armor and his clothing and walked out to join the other 39, therefore bringing their number back up to 40. And the night continued on. Come morning, those frozen, uh, or they were, you know, they were frozen stiff. The, those, those 40, they were still there. Their number did not go down again. It did not change again. They were frozen stiff, yet some of them were still alive. Barely, but they're they're there. So they they were all taken, uh, those who who had died, those who were still alive, uh, and they they were all just burned. And what they did was they took uh, afterwards was they took the ashes and they dumped it into a river. Today, they are still remembered as the forty martyrs of sea bass. Their actions, a testimony in itself. And it saved one right off the bat, and it saved many more since. Matter of fact, their ashes, when it's poured in the river, people went to try to get, you know, collect some of those ashes out of the river. That's how that's how that's how much it spoke even then. 
And you imagine and just say, hey, guess what? You're going out there naked and you're going to freeze to death. And in doing so, you're going to save so, so many. I want you to think, you know, the, here's the effect of, of all this. I want you to think of a candle. And you take that candle and you touch it to another. Now that flame's expanded. You know, it's gone from dark, a little bit brighter, just a little bit. And then you take both of those candles and you touch a couple more candles and so on and so forth. If you've ever been to like a crystal candlelight service, you know what I'm talking about. You go from a room that is extremely dim. And and then eventually as all those those candles keep getting lit and so and lit and lit and lit and so on and so forth, eventually it becomes very very bright. Our testimony, yours and mine, that is the first candle. That testimony, that is the light. That light from God. You share that light. When we go out there, we share that light, we share our testimony. And we give that glory to God when we do it. And we point people to God. As much as we get wrapped up in ourselves, we just can't forget to truly be our brother's keeper and to point the way to Jesus. We share our light, the light that of God that's with us. We share our testimony, and that spreads out. That is being your brother's keeper. That's answering the Great Commission. That is how you give your testimony. Words and actions. Thank you for tuning in to Healing Scars with Pastor Burton. If you'd like to know more about our ministry, you can find us on Facebook at Be The Light Sanctuary. Or you can visit our website at BeTheLightSanctuary.org. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time. God bless.